What's up, freaks? This rip was brought to you by River. River's a Bitcoin company built by Bitcoiners for Bitcoiners the right way. There's no trusted third parties. They build all their infrastructure. They have free DCA because they know it's the best way to buy Bitcoin. So if you want to buy Bitcoin, you want to mine Bitcoin, you want to send Bitcoin over the Lightning Network, you want to plug into their Lightning Network API. If you're a developer, they're building all these tools for you. They also encourage self-custody. Again, they're Bitcoiners. They want to provide an on-ramp for you and then teach you and encourage you to take control of your own Bitcoin. And they're doing this. It's a beautiful company. If you do hold Bitcoin on the exchange, you can know for sure, since they don't rely on any third parties, they don't lend your Bitcoin out, they don't speculate with your Bitcoin, your Bitcoin is held in a multi-sig wallet with 100% reserves. Okay, so go to river.com slash TFTC, take advantage of the no fee DCA, you set up your dollar cost average, you don't pay any fees on those buys. If you're a developer, they have their Lightning Network Services API that you can build on, you can send over Lightning, you can mine via river as well uh, you may have your exchange you may be comfortable with it but if you have you tried river yet it's a question you have to ask yourself if the answer is no go try it that's where all the bitcoiners are hanging out that's where i get my bitcoin as well river.com slash tftc thank you guys for listening if you're listening on youtube please subscribe set the notifications up as well we're going to be putting out a lot of content this year uh, if you want to Subscribe to the podcast feed as well. If you're not around your computer or not listening on YouTube, but you want to catch the podcast on the podcasting feeds, subscribe on your favorite podcasting app. And if you want to learn more about Bitcoin, I write a, a newsletter almost daily during the week. Go to tftc.io, subscribe on the website, and you'll get pure signal on Bitcoin, macroeconomics, geopolitics, whatever tickles my fancy that day. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you for supporting the show. If you can subscribe, rate, review, it goes a long way. We're trying to blow this up in 2023. Enjoy the rip. You've had a dynamic where money's become freer than free. If you talk about a Fed just gone nuts, all, all the central banks going nuts. So it's all acting like safe haven. I believe that in a world where central bankers are tripping over themselves to devalue their currency, Bitcoin wins. In the world of fiat currencies, Bitcoin is the victor. I mean, that's part of the bull case for Bitcoin. If you're not paying attention, you probably should be. Probably should be. You probably should be. Oh, we're live. Oh, okay, cool. Hi, everyone. What the hell is going on? Wow. <laughs> that's a good question. Um, everything? Nothing? all of it um i don't know um the uh to, to be honest with you when you really stop to think about it was anybody surprised that things were going to break when powell got the five percent no i never thought he was going to be able to get five percent because i think i thought things were going to break before that a lot of people did and i think maybe um things probably maybe should have right but there's a lot of vested interest in from a lot of people who are out there you know, trying to keep the system as it is currently constituted alive, hoping that they can get Powell to change his mind and go back down. I mean, I think that's what the, when you really stop to look at, like, you know, I, I, every time I do this, I, like, all I can see is a bunch of people's oxes being gored, right? And the people who squelch and squeal the loudest are usually the ones whose oxes, oxes are being, oxen are being gored the most, right? Because they're the ones who have the microphone and, Frankly, they're the ones who control most of the official microphone. The Bloombergs, the CNBCs, the, you know, all the financial press is all owned and controlled by what I call Davos. It's not hard. It's not hard. And that's all an extension of the British crown and the British tabloid press and MI6 and, you know, the old European money and all that stuff. And so, and, you know, the old Northeastern American money and all the rest of it, right? So if they're constantly, frankly, bitching that Powell should go back to the zero bound, Maybe it's because they want him to go back to the zero bound because maybe they're going to go broke if he doesn't go back to the zero bound because that's how they were built in the first place. I mean, how does a currency as fundamentally broken in conception as the euro 
survive as long as it has, unless you had a complicit global reserve currency liquefying your crappy architecture through an offshore shadow banking system that dwarfs the domestic banking system of the United States, of the global of that global reserve currency, which in this case, this case happens to be the United States. This is the point that Daniel DiMartino Booth makes all the time, which is that the shadow banking system, which is effectively where Davos's power is, mm, it's in all the non-bank offshore, non-bank transactions and leverage. And that leverage gets infinite the closer you get to the zero bound. These people went negative on interest rates for seven years. So do you think the leverage within European capital markets is a little is a little crazy, even in comparison to the Fed? And if you don't think that that was coordinated by two open by an open communist named Barack Obama who put all of these people in power, and Janet Yellen, who's ultimately who when she ran the San Francisco Fed ran cover for all of these people going crazy during 2008, it, countrywide, Indie Mac, all those guys, and then did it all again. Silicon Valley Bank signature, all the, all the shit coins that were, you know, being bankrolled out of these banks. And I use that word very loosely. Like, at the end of the day, do you really think that if you have a bunch of guys at the Fed going, you know what, uh, we want to be in charge again? 25 basis points. Oh, you don't like that? 50. How about 75? You don't like 75? How about we do 75 again? How about we keep doing this until you break? Because the only reason that their balance sheets were even close to solvent at the leverage that they were at was because they could get money for nothing and their chicks for free, to quote Mark Goffler. I mean, that's what it comes down to. This is all just downstream of cheap money. It's why you're it's why you have a podcast, Marty. It's why Bitcoin yeah. exists. Because it was created in the aftermath of the global financial crisis to QE and ZERP and everything else. I mean, it's, it's explicit, right? In, you know, in the original white paper, which I read back in 2010, like I, all this stuff is right there. So yeah, we're at 5%. Yeah. And I think I the one I'll be six, but I, I'm enjoying what he's doing. I think the one thing that really validates your thesis too, because a lot of people have been kvetching over the dot plots from 2021, particularly, right. I believe they say, Hey, we allocated, our treasury holdings this way because the dot plots were telling us this and that's why we're effectively insolvent when this crisis is unfolding. Well, I mean, you know, one of the things that I've been, you know, look, two, let's go back three years ago. Three years ago, I was a, an offshore banking system, shadow banking system neophyte. You know, I mean, I, I sat down, I, you know, when people talked about this of my eyes glazed over, I mean, seriously, I used to read Jeff Snyder over to Lomber partners and not understand a word, (laughs) <laughs> half of what he was writing about because he's a i mean jeff's an interesting guy and i happen to disagree with him now and we happen to be on opposite sides of the euro dollar fence divide now but he also taught me a lot and he but unfortunately on one writer to the other jeff dude a lot less inside baseball a lot more clear concise writing like let us know what's actually going on if you actually want us to be if you actually want to communicate to us when people when you you know and I, that should have been my clue because when people don't write clearly, and you can accuse me of doing this, because I'm I'm very elliptical on how I, I write, and it's never it's not always a, a good not always a good look, right? Um, but you know, it, it's something that um, Daniel Booth put in her book, I just re, just finally, finally finished reading Fed Up the other day, and um, she was talking about Zoltan Pozar when she first met Pozar back in the, during the, the, the financial crisis in 2008. And she said, you know, intellectuals are really good at like obfuscating, you know, I don't know quite how she put it, but, you know, dressing up there are arguments with all these little jargon and flowery ideas and everything else in order to obfuscate the fact that they don't actually know anything. And then there are the real communicators who go, who do go out of their way to try and explain very complex things in the simplest way imaginable for everyone to get it. And yeah, she, of the, course, was talking about Pozar when she was talking about the latter person. And most of the people at the Fed, a la Greenspan, right? Yeah. So, and I think that, you know, when, I, when you really stop to think about how, I mean, this is part of the reason I think why Jeff probably started Eurodollar University podcast with Emil was to try and make this stuff more 
cogent and, and more communicable to people, but still, it's, I, I still would listen to those podcasts more. And I finally yeah. just have to like do the work myself. Yeah, no, I'm the same way with Jeff. I think I've certainly learned a lot from him, but there is certainly that aspect of, and do you actually know what you're talking about? Like, it's so complex that are you I don't trying to convince yourself? I don't think it's as complex as he makes it out to be. Yeah. This is the point. I mean, that being said, again, you know, Pozar had a, you know, Booth talks about Pozar walking into Pozar's office at the New York Fed in like 2009 or 2010 or whatever with a, her, his entire map of the shadow banking system as he saw it. And it was like, you know, walking into Fox Mulder's office, yeah. you know, and like, worse, right? It's like the Pepe and, Sylvia you know, meme. What's that? It's like the Pepe Sylvia meme from It's Always Sunny and Charlie's like pointing. Yeah. He's like, yeah. yeah. Um, I've never watched it. Uh, it's always something in Philadelphia, so I'm not sure what you're talking about, but I'll take your word for it. Like, it's just a, this crazy spider web. It's like looking at a chart from, uh, who's the guy? That, um, oh, God, we used to look, look at his charts all the time. I can't remember his name now. But his charts were just, you know, a whole bunch of parallel lines and, like, and the candlesticks in the middle. I can't remember the guy's name now. Um, they used to Bollinger? Him all the, what's that? Bollinger? No, not Bollinger. It was another gold. It was a gold guy. I can't remember. His, I can't remember who I'm talking about now. Now it'll come to me later and I'll be like, Oh my God, I can't, can't believe I forgot this guy's name. Um, but it's the same kind of thing. It's just a tremendous spider web of stuff trying to map the whole thing. But you know, it still just reduces down to it's allowed to proliferate like this because of zero bound money. You move money away from the cost of money away from the zero bound. And then 90% of that collapses immediately, <laughs> you know, or at least starts to collapse. And then, you know, holds on for dear life for as long as possible. And literally these guys are hodling, you know, policy wise in order to hope that they can get through this and that, you know, and then push from a political perspective, you know, Powell out the door or make it untenable for him to maintain this policy so that he can then have to pivot and go back to the zero bound. I don't think that's going to happen. I also don't think he's going to keep rates at 6%, 5 or 6% forever either. I think he's going to keep them there for a year, year and a half, maybe even two. And then they're going to come back. Then they're going to start coming back down. The point being, what I was trying to get out originally is that thanks to Jeff, we understand something about the Eurodollar futures curve and how it operates and how it's the tail always wagging the monetary policy dog. And for that, no argument in the guy's debt. I, I say that with no reservations, no if ands, no buts, no commas, no nothing. That part of it. But today, I have to think about it going, okay, well, that what you're describing, and you have to, and what Jeff has accurately described, were all of these years where the Fed was complicit in helping blow up the shadow banking system. What happens when the Fed's not complicit? and allowing the shadow banking system to proliferate. What does that world look like? It's a simple question. Does it look like what we've got today? I think so. I may be wrong, but it's certainly the question you should be asked. That's the question I asked myself oh, you know, about a year into this. I, about a year ago, I finally asked that question. I'm like, why, is, why does Snyder not see this? As long as the, as long as the, 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 the Fed's not complicit in this, if the Fed doesn't want to go back to the zero bound, eventually it'll retrain the market. Eventually it'll do away with the Fed put. Eventually the market will have to deal with what the Fed wants to do. Because the Fed's proven in the past, I mean, Volcker proved in the past that the markets were, the markets can be mispriced for a long time and he can still wring out all that, that leverage. He did it in the, you know, 80 through 80, 82. I mean, he did it 79 through 82, you know, and it's been done before. And I'm a big free believer in free markets. Y'all, I mean, y'all know this. So it's, I'm not trading in my libertarian or free market economics bona fides here for, you know, simping for the Fed. I'm just saying, look, the Fed's a real actor. They have agency. They're going to use that agency in the way that they think is best for them and for the people whom they serve. Why would you not analyze their actions from that perspective? If you're not going to be willing to analyze their actions from that perspective, I'm not willing to listen to you because you're not a serious observer of markets. It's just that simple, right? Yeah. You, you, have to, you have to give the devil its due, even if you don't like him, right? Yeah. So that's, that's where this started. That's where, we're, that's where I think we are today. So I look at it and I say, okay, well, if I were the Fed, and, well, okay, I'll make it even better for you. I, if I were Emperor Palpatine 
and I wanted to re regain control over my own monetary system, what would I do? Well, I'd first cut off City of London by getting rid of LIBOR. I'd re-index all the debt in the United States on a, on a domestic rate that is set by the marketplace, SOFR, which is set by the repo markets, uh -huh. not 18 bank, 18 bank heads getting together and going, yeah, it should be this. And G-chat. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. And then what would I do after that? Well, I'd start raising interest rates when everybody didn't want me to. And I'd start draining the offshore dollar markets of liquidity before I started raising interest rates. If I politically, if I wasn't able to start raising interest rates, because in t summer of 2021, politically, he wasn't able to, because he hadn't been reconfirmed for a second term yet. So the best he could do then was start draining the dollar pump, which Yellen was getting set to dump a trillion and a half dollars of CARES Act money onto the market raised by Donald Trump and Mnuchin. So he had to blunt that and then you know, start bringing out the leverage. So what do you do after that? Well, you wait to see if you can get reconfirmed. If you, if, if uh, you can get, if you can put some behind the scenes pressure on Congress to not spend, just wait for the inflation story to, you know, run out the clock on Yellen and Biden and Obama and all the rest of them and Pelosi. Well, then you get what you, then the fall of 2021 makes perfect sense to you. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. That's what it makes it perfect sense to me. So, uh, and then you just, you know, you force the, you force the moment to its crisis point, force Biden to allow, to say, okay, I, I'll renominate uh, Powell because I don't have any other choice because he doesn't, politically, he has nobody else because you can't push Lael Brainerd through the Senate. The Senate basically told Biden, no, we want Powell. The reason that the Senate told Biden that they want Powell is because Wall Street wanted Powell. Wall Street writes the checks for the Senate. This is not hard. This is no. the way it works. This is the real Washington, D.C., as we all know. So I'm not even like talking about anything here that we don't all already know. So why is I don't understand why I get so much pushback on this when you really when you break it down those terms. I'm not saying you're doing it, but it's like in general, it's just it's really weird to me because to me, it's just like really simple. Like these are the incentives. Obviously, this is the these are these are the people, and they don't it, like it's not tough. The commercial banks in New York don't want to be, you know, subservient to Klaus Schwab and a bunch of commies over in Europe. Well, and that's not that's the one piece of pushback I've seen toward your thesis is that look, they incited a banking crisis here in the U.S., but it seems like when you consider who actually owns the Fed, which is like the larger, larger systemically important banks, and actually they're game plan may be playing out perfectly where you have a consolidation from the regional banks all the way up to these big commercial banks as well. Well, there's, I think there's, I think that's a little bit overblown as well, because I mean, and I've been talking about, I, and I wrote about this and it's a fair criticism. It's a fair point because every other banking crisis that's ever happened in the United States since the formation of the fed has saw a consolidation of smaller banks into bigger banks. And you know, the bigger banks eat the smaller banks. But in every one of these in the past, this is the interesting part about this one, Barney, that I think, think people should really consider. And I and I've thought about this comment, and I've thought about that criticism long and hard. And I've commented on it explicitly, which is to say this. In every other, in 2008, long-term capital management, the savings and loan crisis, you know, whatever, pick them all, right? Every time it was the big banks that got into trouble. 2008, it certainly was. Uh -huh. They were all broke. They were all in trouble. The shadow banking system had blown up. They blew it. I mean, honestly, Bernanke blew it up when he rose, raised interest rates and didn't know what he was doing. Didn't really, because, no, because to, tell, to listen to Booth tell the story, no one at the Fed even understood that the shadow banking system existed and what it would do when they started raising rates. And you could ascribe malice to what happened sure i'm not above that i'm not above ascribing malice to jamie diamond in 2008 right or any of these guys you know we we wanted to get rid of dick fold because he was making us look bad okay this is how we're not this is why we're not going to bail out Lehman. you know by the time 2008 to come around fold was you know basically persona non grata all across wall street fine and there was a lot of people who were you know dead to rights they were in trouble. 
they needed the good assets on the smaller banks balance sheets in order to stabilize their own balance sheets in some in some ways and then start papering the process over with zero bound rates interest on excess reserves and you know qb123 operation twist all the rest of it right and that's what happened and that was bernanke's plan the entire time to try and recapitalize the banks quarter point i you know basically a quarter point over the fed funds rate over time fine <clears throat> This time is different. This time it's the small banks that were in trouble. The big banks are fine. Huh. Do, do the, and so do the big banks really want some of the, uh, most of the loans that are on these smaller banks' balance sheets? Not really. They might want some of the commercial real estate that the, that the regional banks got themselves into. As Daniel, again, keeps pointing out, 77% of commercial real estate in the United States is owned by small, small and regional banks, as opposed to traditionally it's around 50%. Of commercial real estate loans are made to small banks. Yeah, signature so over, massive. That, signature yeah, massive. Signature, it was even worse. Yeah. But my, my point, the, the point being is that okay, so the regional banks are in trouble here. Fair enough. Um they were over leveraged. But why were they over leveraged? Because they needed to go out and get yield because they couldn't make any money in traditional banking. Just like the pension funds had to go into, you know, leverage CLOs with BlackRock and all, you know, all this stuff, right? So everybody's screaming at the zero balance, looking, searching for yield, and the only way you can get yield in that kind of market is leverage. And it's leveraged on overpriced assets, and in the hope that those leverage, that that leverage will continue because the overpriced assets will keep going up because they'll just keep pumping more money into the system in order to get the nominal yield to pay people off in depreciating currency units, be they euros, yen, dollars, or whatever. But this is how. So in effect, they've already been defaulting on all the, the pension requirements, the the, the pension. Um, uh, unfunded liabilities through inflation. They've been doing it for years, right? So, but when you reach the, the point where that's no longer going to work anymore, well, and there's another opportunity, there's another way of dealing with this, which is, hey, you know, we could reverse dollar flow from around the world. We could just become Japan in this sense. Not in the sense of like the Kyle Bass sense and, oh my God, the Japanese were 216% of debt to GDP and all that stuff that Japan's going to explode. No, no. We all become Mrs. Watanabe. Mm -hmm. If the Fed raises interest rates to 5 6% and the, and the Fed sets up a virtuous cycle to bring those treasuries that are stuffed on central bank balance sheets home and allows, which allows for the regional banks to start investing in treasuries and then paying interest um, to passbook savings to people who don't have a U.S. Tre treasury direct account or any of this other stuff. This, hey man, I want something better than 0.15% of my passbook savings. Like why? And, and if you think about what the real problem is, it's that. Right now, we're in this, like, we're in this, this ugly period where the regional banks were sitting here with holes in their balance sheets because the treasury portfolios were 20 to 25 percent under underwater. They yeah, have these big up. holes in their in their balance sheets, so they're continuing to pocket what they can get out of their investments in order to 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 shore up the holes in their balance sheets, and they're not paying their depositors the vig, you know, a part of the vig. They're paying nothing still, and they're pocketing five when normally they would pay us two and keep three or pay us three and keep two net interest margin. There is no, there was no net interest margin. Now their net interest margin has been rising, I guess. I haven't really looked, but I would imagine it is, but their balance sheets are in trouble. So their cash flow better and, um, and balance sheet impaired. Okay. Well, the Fed just made them whole with the bank term funding program. So they can pledge those securities, those treasuries are underwater on at par go out and buy new treasuries with them, and the only thing they're on the hook for is the interest on the loan. That is a way to immediately shore up a lot of their holes. It just sets up the virtuous, it sets up the right cycle, the right set of incentives for them to start clearing their decks so they can start offering positive interest rates on savings accounts. And I'm even starting to see it. You're starting to see it in CD rates, you're starting to see it in money market rates, you're starting to see it in... Um, here and there in high dollar denominated savings accounts. I was in Wells Fargo, I was in Wells Fargo the other day and they're talking about, you know, uh, a savings account with a teaser rate of paying 
and then you know two and a quarter percent after that or whatever. You know, six months they'll pay you three percent to put your put five thousand dollars into Wells Fargo. All right, it's, it's Wells. When I see that for my local credit union, and that's coming, then you know that this is working. What do you think the and, likely the likelihood that they keep the um, the loan term to one year? You think they extend that this time next I year? I think they may have to. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, I, I I think it's possible. I mean, but again, it, this isn't QE. Like, this is, you know, again, it's not QE. It's not, you know, the Fed adding to their balance sheet isn't QE. Like, the Fed added a lot of, most of the money to their balance sheet during the financial crisis before QE was ever admitted. They added a lot of money to the balance sheet in order to provide temporary liquidity to the market because that's what the Fed's supposed to do. Again, not, this is not an endorsement of, of having a lender of last resort like the Federal Reserve. I'm, you know, I'm, to me, it's anathema, but it's, it doesn't matter. It's the world we live in. It's the money we have. And until we, you know, until we get to a point where we have a better system, and how about this? How are we going to get from the system we're at unless we go through a transition period where, you know, we, we try and bring the, the, the system back to where it was, say, 100 years ago, where we had rational commercial banking with a central bank, right? Which is what I'm, it's all I'm positing that we just, that the Fed just, goes back to something close to its original mandate, which, you know, the old commie freaking FDR destroyed back in the 30s. Yeah. So. Yeah. So what do you think happens mm. over the next year as they keep rates relatively elevated? I think Europe is in trouble. Yeah. I just think Europe doesn't have a leg to stand on. I think that that's part of the thing. I think that's absolutely what's going on here. I think it's very, very clear that Powell can't say any of this, okay? He can't say it. And people close to the Fed can't say this either, okay? Because if they did, it's like, you know, it would immediately destroy them and destroy all of their models, their credibility, and everything else. They have to keep couching it in terms of inflation and we're fighting this and, you know, all that stuff. That's what they're doing. And that's what they're going to do. Like, I look at the jobs report from this morning. You and I are doing this on on, on the 4th, right? So I guess, I guess we're live, right? But I'm just to remind everybody in the future, we recorded this on, on Tuesday the 4th, and this morning the markets went, you know, haywire because the jobs numbers weren't any good. All right, well, that's nice. Yesterday, OPEC cut production by a million barrels a day. You think cost push inflation is not coming back from a commodity perspective, isn't coming back coming right back around when oil goes back to $100 a barrel? Like, yeah. what do you think is going to happen here? You don't think a Powell's going to use that that stabilizing of inflation at six and a half or five and a half percent when it should be coming down and it doesn't? To think out two, three, four months from now, when inflation is supposed to be down back down in the fours, and what if it stays at five, six percent because oil is back to ninety to five, a hundred dollars a barrel, natural gas is back over three dollars a, a million BTUs, copper's holding steady at four dollars a pound as opposed to where it was before all this started at two fifty, two seventy a pound. Aluminum's at 250 a pound. Like, yeah, year over year inflation may quote unquote come down, but we still have a structural problem that prices haven't gotten back to where they were. And if oil stays high, then the input costs for all the industrial metals, timber, diesel fuel, everything goes up. Food production goes up and inflation will stay higher for longer, which means that the Fed will have to keep rates higher for longer, which is exactly what Powell wants to do. He needs market cover through the inflation data in order to keep this running. Now, whether he's going to be able to do that if the credit markets you know, continue to implode like they have is a good question. I don't know if he will or he won't. I just know that Janet Yellen's going to fight him tooth and claw every step of the way, especially over the debt ceiling. She's going to do like, just like Bernanke, uh, just like, I'm sorry, Pelosi, try and tie the debt ceiling to some other political... Um, uh, uh, issue in order to try and, you know, blackmail the Republicans into caving as opposed to what, remember, they won that fight. Oh, it seems like remember, she's tra beginning to posture for that too with her climate change is, a, is an existential mm -hmm. threat that we need to attack. So you could see Green Yellen New is, Deal. Yeah, yeah, Yellen is, 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 is pure, pure Davos at, at this point. And, you know, when I asked Danielle about this when she was on my podcast, and you know, and she sidestepped the question, fair enough, that's fine. 
sort of, you know, which is that, you know, do you think they were incompetent or do you think they were vandals? I happen to think they were vandals. She called them shockingly naive. I happen to think that that's a, <laughs> that's a nice, uh, that's a, that, a that, that's a nice, way. you know, yeah, polite way of saying you're right. But I don't know. You know, you, you, you know, y'all review the, the, the tape and, you know, you, uh, you draw your own conclusions from that. I'm a, I will not put words in Danielle's mouth. No one needs to. Let's just put it that way. Um, and she's so, um, you know, from, but when I, I think about it, that, that's, I'm on record beginning of the year. I, you know, I put out 10 predictions for 2023 and inflation would stay higher for longer. Oil would net, wouldn't break down much below the, the, the January low, the January open. What do we get? Eight bucks. And now we're, you know, was there for an hour and a half and now we're back to 85 bucks a barrel. We opened the year in the high seventies, mid seventies, high to mid seventies. Um, the U.S. is probably going to have to pull out of Syria. Saudi Arabia is going to jump ship and, and uh, you know, align with China. The petrodollar is going to end. These, all these things are already, it's already April. And I'm like already right on like six, six or seven of these. Um, and Powell's going to go, you know, the one I think is in the most uh, trouble is that Powell may go, that I think Powell will go to 7%. I, you know, that was January. I made a call. He, he only needs to get the six. Hell, he only needs to hold it to five until the end of next year, and he'll do ninety-five percent of what he of the damage that he needs he needs to do. I think he goes yeah. to seven. It's like I, I mean, I don't know about you, but Mises would be cheering it from his grave if he went to seven. <laughs> yeah, and now when you when you consider the inflation rates that came out of the UK and Germany the last couple months mm-hmm. too, if oil moves mm-hmm. higher, Europe oh, yeah. is royally screwed. I saw something this afternoon. My friends over at Mitalcino in Italy posted a thing about the uh, the eurozone's ca- uh, current account. Just posted a, a monthly deficit last month for the first time, like total across the eurozone, and it's mostly France, Italy, and Germany. Interestingly, the Danes posted a massive ca- current account surplus, which is which harkens back to something a patron of mine said to me about oh three and a half ma- three and a half years ago maybe. We were, we've been discussing, you know, Brexit and, you know, whether Hungary will leave or Italy will leave, all this stuff when we were, when we were ha- hot and heavy into European politics. And one of them said, dude, you want to watch the Danes? The Danes are the ones you want to watch. They're the one, they'll, they will jump ship first. And I'm like, huh, okay. Asked him for why. And he didn't really give me much of an answer that I could work with, but, you know. And there it is staring at us. If they're, if they're funding, you know, if they're the only country with any kind of, you know, current account surplus, whether there's any kind of, in, you know, in, in production investment, you know, net inflow. They have a high incentive. The entire Arizona, that's trouble. Yeah. And the fact that Italy, or excuse me, France, Germany, uh, and Italy are the top three contributing yeah. to a, a negative deficit is not good or to a deficit. Right. Exactly. It's not like we're talking about Greece, you know, and, you know, I don't know Montenegro. Well, we're talking about, we're talking about the, the, the three that, that make up the tripod on which the whole European union stands. Yeah. Right. Without those three, there is no European union. So, yeah. eh, you know, hard to say. Yeah. And you, I mean, you mentioned it too, like Saudi Arabia. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean when the Prince came out, what was it earlier today or yesterday? It was like a, I don't really care to keep relationships with the U S like, what do you, what do you yeah, see no. this bricks pivot that they're making? How does that throw a variable I'm, into I'm the be- mix? I'm beginning to call it the bricks bricks because there's two eyes and there's two S's now two eyes, India and Iran. And for years, I've always said that India during the Trump administration, India wasn't even part of the bricks for all intents and purposes. It was Iran. That was the, really the eye in bricks. And now, now we add Saudi Arabia to South Africa. So, you know, and then Brazil actually is kind of, a, uh, but no, they, but then Brazil and China just put, just, you know, signed a bilateral trade agreement in their own currencies. So, you know, every day, you know, every day that you make the dollar more expensive to use is another day that it's in someone else's comparative advantage to not use the dollar. You know, it's not, the world isn't a series of step functions. It's not a, well, this, then that, you know, it's not a series of discrete on or off switches. Everything is a curve and a continuum, right? We all, you and I have different 
needs and wants and everything else. So it, and they only make certain perfect sense that our behavior is going to be maybe roughly the same, but not the same. And so you may jump ship from the old system if you're, you know, India later than Iran would. Because Iran, for example, we made use, use of the dollar nearly impossible. We raised the cost of using dollars to the moon, right? So it was important that, you know, Iran had to then shift and figure out what else to do. India, we never really sanctioned. So they're still in that zone of, well, you know, but now every day that everybody else starts to use the yuan or the ruble or, you know, whatever, or we'll take the rupee as, you know, a settlement, uh, you know, for, you know, in exchange for, you know, washing machines or weed or barrels of oil or whatever. Well, then that just relatively speaking makes the, the dollar worth less to them. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be, you know, overnight. It just means that it's one or 2% or 3%. And, you know, you compound 1% year over year over year. It's pretty soon you're talking about real percentages. Yeah. And it makes sense too. It's all about network effects. Like the BRICS countries yeah. are building their network effect up. Yep. And it's so short-sighted by the U.S. with the sanctioning. Like you, they literally artificially constricted the potential for their own network effect. I agree. And this was the this was what Jim Sinclair warned us all about back in 2010 when Obama went after UBS to open up the Swiss banking system and threatened it with SWIFT expulsion. So the minute you said so it's a, the dollar, he's, for all intents and purposes, he's like the dollar is done now. I mean, we haven't seen it finished, but he opened up pandora's box and that's that and we all know the parable you know once you open up pandora's box you can't close it back up again yeah once you go nuclear in any negotiation there's no way to back down other than you know dropping the bomb yeah which is trying to like conceptualize like how this all plays out when you want mm -hmm. settled ruby settled ruble settled trades they're talking about like their gold back commodity backed basket for a settlement yeah. network. Obviously, we still have the dollar. Gold, is gold, did it close in all-time high today? No, no, it, no. It, it, it did not, but it didn't need to. Uh, a daily close above 2,000 is pretty good. So let's wait for a weekly close above 2,000. Yeah. I mean, and then we'll wait for a monthly close above 2,000. That's the what, way I look at That's the way I look at the world. So if that happens, what does that signal to you? Hmm. It signals that money is getting the ground. Bitcoin at 28,000 in this market is money going to ground. People trying to find ways, you know, uh, trying to find ways of, pro of protecting their, their purchasing power. You know, they they don't know what to do. But at the same time, look at the rates on treasuries. People are scared now, but at the same time, people are, what's, what's happened, this is an interesting thing. Martin Armstrong brought this up the other day in a post. I think it was in a private blog post. So if you guys didn't see it, it's, you know, I'm, I am a subscriber over at, at Marty's service to the, at the lowest level, just basically for the private blog and some, um, some basic stuff from Socrates. Mostly I just have it for the private blog because I find the private blog where he really lets his hair down, metaphorically speaking. Um, and he was talking about FIMA, F-I-M-A. That's the foreign, that's the Fed's foreign repo facility, right? Now, I made a big deal about June 16th, 2021, when the Fed raised interest rates, the, the RRP facility rate, five place basis points about the Fed funds rate, all right? But equally important, and I haven't talked about it as much, but I did talk about it here and there, which was the next Fed meeting, they put FEMA into place. So the first thing he did, Powell did, was start draining the, the world of Euro dollars, of, of leverage within the offshore dollar markets by starting to drain massive amounts of liquidity, blow up carry trades, blow up, you know, you know just to start deleveraging that system. So now, and then he builds a massive war chest of dollars sitting in the reverse repo facility because the money markets aren't, you know, he's still at the zero bound. So there's no demand to put money into the money markets. There's no, there's no, there's no transmission mechanism. The classic transmission mechanism is broken and he knows it's broken. So now we got to create a new transmission mechanism. So you can use the RRP facility as a means by which to get a, create a, a big stock of dollars. Knowing full well, that the U.S. banks won't take European debt as repo collateral, right? Means that the only person who can then be a source of 
treasuries are people currently holding them or the mm -hmm. Fed, right? Because the U.S. banks won't give them to you. The primary dealers, the broker dealers are like, yeah, no. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, maybe it's 70 cents on the dollar, but I'm not, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trading you a German bund trading at minus 0.8%. I'm not giving you par for that. No. I'll give you 70 cents on the dollar or 70 cents on the euro, but I'm not giving you par. You just, you know, sorry, Chrissy, it just ain't happening. So you create FEMA in order to control the ebb and flow of dollars and treasuries and to allow those who need treasuries, need treasuries to come and get them from the Fed. And that's what's going on right now. I think that's what the rally, I mean, this is what Marty mentioned the other day. And I, when he mentioned it the other day, I was like, and it's like, that's part of the reason why the massive rally in the U.S. Treasuries is that in order to keep the, the European banking system from imploding because of the desperate need for dollars, they had to belly up the FEMA for $60 billion during the height of the crisis, Credit Suisse and Silicon Valley Bank. The, previously, that facility, I think it hit like $1.4 billion was the highest. So clearly... There was stress, but here's the gig. They didn't lend, the Fed didn't lend them those dollars at 0% like they did in the past. Those dollars were being lent out at nearly 5%. Yeah. Those treasuries were being lent out at nearly 5%. Yeah, so FEMA is essentially like the cattle herding mechanism to get people to go to the Fed to get these dollars. Right, well, they, because the US banking system wouldn't deal with them, so now, now you gotta deal with the Fed. The Fed can now set the rate, now can set the cost of dollars, they are now controlling. Now you, this is your these two facilities, the RP facility and FEMA. Not completely, but for the most part, now they are the transmission system for Fed monetary policy, and the Fed gets to control the value of them. Which is why I think Jeff's Jeff Snyder's arguments about the euro dollar system and just analyzing the euro dollar futures curve, which is inverted, is you know it's. It was very useful, but I think it's not. The mechanics are different now. The mechanics are different now. Thank you. That's a good way of putting it. The world is different because the Fed is now actively attacking and is actively hostile to that system and wants that system brought back under its control. And it's the dog, and the dog's barking, and it's, and it's literally willing to chew its own tail off if necessary. Yeah. To yes. extend the metaphor into, you know, lunacy. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, it's insane that you have your finger on the pulse of all of this. Because keeping up, that's the thing, they, they use these facilities, right, to create those cattle herding architectures and those mechanisms, um, the mechanics that really throw a wrench in how people view this, this system as a whole. And that's the thing that they come, they become really addicted to spinning up all these new facilities. Yeah, there's that too. I mean, but I think it's like I think they're all a a, a reaction to incredibly abnormal times. I think that if Powell had been Fed chair in 2007, 2008, he just let the whole system collapse back then. He would have never put the two percent inflation target in place. He's now having to, he's inherited it. He's now having to use it to his advantage mm -hmm. in order to try and get rational control over the monetary system. Look, and again, this is in no way, manner, shape, or form do I think it's set in stone that he's going to pull this off. Okay. I'm just describing what I see, the incentives, the mechanics, and where we are. Do I think the Fed has the better set of whole cards in a poker sense? Absolutely, I do. I mean, the Fed's the one that prints the dollars. The political situation in the United States is clearly anti-inflationary. It's clearly against what's happening on the Hill. Like, you know, they've had to steal elections for Christ's sake in order to pump the Democrats up to, and then indict Trump in a show. Like, this is all just theater now. And people are like, they're sick of it. They just want people, they just want their leaders to act like normal people and they're refusing to do it. And they all, you know, God's forbid that I even like have to, you know, use the term, you know, I look at all of them, I go, and Trump's the most normal of the bunch. 
Like right. that makes me sick to my stomach in, in many ways. Right. Yeah. But no, I, I had an interesting experience with this over the weekend. I was in Philadelphia mm-hmm. at home and uh, we went to brunch in the city at a French restaurant called park and the Biden family w- walked in and ate breakfast wow. while we were there. But they literally just sat down and ate. I don't even think they said hi to anybody. It was very weird. It was very, uh, you'd think it'd be like a big appearance where he's going around right. shaking people's hands, but now they just sat down, ate, and left. Well, they, they, he can't go and glad hand with anybody without, like, you know, embarrassing himself. You know, yeah. they let him out in public. I hope, I hope they had changed his depends right before, you know, he went out the door. Well, it was like they were flaunting it, too, because Hunter was with them. And I was like, yeah. It's like, how are you bringing him around? Uh, considering everything that's going on with that, that laptop report. It's like they're I mean, shoving it in people's faces almost. They really are, Marty. I mean, this is the thing I, I think I, I want, you know, when I, I think about, when I tie all this stuff together and I start thinking about the Trump indictment and everything else, I'm like, this is very clear that it, the, strategy is, the strategies being employed here are multi-vector. You are, the United States is being attacked and Western culture and just in general, just capitalism for lack of a better term individualism for, you know, in, in an ideological sense is being attacked from multiple vectors. Okay. From every vector from an institutional perspective, from an economic, cultural, political, legal, and every, every myth that we have of America as a, a land that is, has some semblance of fairness and decency. I think the way I put it the other day that, you know, we're all, we're maximally, Americans are maximally cynical about their politicians. You know, we know that they're lying when their lips are moving, but at the same time, we have this, we still have this belief that this, that the system itself gets it right often enough to keep the lights on. Right. Yeah. People fall back on checks and balances, which is yeah, and all, and all, and just on and everything, you know? Yeah. But our systems are strong enough that, yeah, people were, some people get away with murder and yada, 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 and the bad things happen, but the system itself is still strong enough to make sure that the whole society keeps rop- operating. Well, not if it's being actively attacked from within and without by multiple, from along multiple vectors, some of whom, for example, would anybody blame the Russians for engaging in, you know, and engaging in, in hostile activities against the United States? I wouldn't. I don't like it. But at the same time, you, get you know, it. I get it. And, and, you know, actions have consequences. Right. And, you know, we can argue about what China's motivations are. We can argue what Iran's motivations are. We can argue about. But, you know, when we see it from our we see it from our our supposedly European ancestors who are just literally treating us like, well, no, your job is you're the shock troops to go fight and die. Charge of the light brigade. You're supposed to go and kill the, the slobs and the slopes. I hate to use that term, but that's the way they think. Yeah. That's their term, not mine. Like when you think of it that way, that's our. Jo- that's what they think of us as Americans. That's our job to them. You know, the Eastern Europeans get to be their. Uh oh. Is it us? Right. Oh, we just lost you there My- for about ten seconds. Yeah, I can see I'm, I was, on the replay wasn't good. It happens. I'm on Starlink, so every once in a while, you know, you shift from satellite to satellite. So what I was saying is, just, you know, I've said this before. You know, when you think about the European aristocracy and you really think about who they are and what they believe, it's clear that they just look at the rest of the world as, you know, a bunch of serfs that are supposed to serve them. It's the way they prosecuted their history for the last eight, nine hundred years. Like, why would anything change? So, um, I mean, when you stop the, you know, when you look at it that way, it's clear that, like, that's what we should be worried about. It's that mindset that we have to be worried about. The Chinese are negotiable. The Russians are eminently negotiable. The Russians know they have a, a relatively weak hand. I mean, in the grand scheme of things. But at the same time, you know, saying, come on, you're... man. Europeans are trying to have us tied at the hip, which is dragging us they down. They want their cake and eat it too. It's really that simple. They yeah. want to control us. They think, you know, Soros 
couches it in that, you know, those ideological open society flowery terms. But really it just comes down to he wants to run things or he wants his son to run things and, 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 and you know, wants, that's what he wants. He wants the United States torn down. And, you know, he's willing to stop at nothing to get it. Yeah. And he's not the only one. He's just one of, he's just, you know, the, he's just the PR man. Same, same thing with, with Schwab and the rest of them. But yeah, they're just from that. Even worse when it's, you know, the people behind the scenes. Yeah. Maybe, think, maybe I'm too optimistic or too naive, but I do because uh, when it's rotten at the top, it seeps down to the lowest levels of society. And I think people are, are getting to a point, particularly in cities like San Francisco or Philadelphia, where we're having all these smash and grabs. Like, mm-hmm. what the fuck? Like, how are we not? You know, you're, I mean, Trump's whole situation with them uh, launching a felony on him, something that's never been done before. Or right. literally rewriting the law in real time um, to I mean, create political the prisoners. Of, yeah, when the Southern District of New York won't touch Trump's case with a 10 foot cattle prod, I mean, this is these are people who can indict a ham sandwich and get a conviction 95% of the time. And they wouldn't touch the case. That tells you how weak the case is, but they don't care. Now we can go into Trump's indictment. There's about 18 different ways to look at it. And you know, I go through the the flow chart. I go through Davos's flow chart, and I say, no matter how this turns out, it's good for us because the United States is brought low in the process. Unless, of course, Trump survives this, runs for president, and wins. Because, not that I really want Trump to be president again. I don't. I, I, I. I'll vote for him again because you know why not? Because if for nothing else, because I know that's what they don't want, you know. And maybe you know a second Trump term would be stronger simply because he now he knows just the depths of how, you know, vile these people are, and he understands the rules of the game better than when he was in office the first time. But. What's really important about this is that they know that by making a mockery of the legal system and the election system and our you know, rule of law, all of it, and they, it, they attack all the foundational myths and all the foundations, you destroy the society. Like, society is a shared hallucination, dude. Like, it's, you know, we all... You know, we all abide by the rules because it's in our best interest to abide by the rules. But when the rules don't serve us, why should we, you know, why should we uh, follow them at all? I mean, and, and don't get me wrong. I realize I'm on a Bitcoin podcast here. And I, and you, you know that I, 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 I get on the Bitcoin maxis a lot. And I do it for this reason. I get why there's a kind of religious fervor mm-hmm. around Bitcoin because of what I just said that desire and need to, for trust to be brought back, that need, it's, just, it's, the, same, it's the same thing that, that, that many Christians are holding on to. It's like, what happened to this country? What happened to our society? Like, this is our way forward. This is the thing that can help us. I, I know, I, I, and I don't, I'm not even unsympathetic to it. I, I, I'd, be, I'd be ecstatic to be wrong that Bitcoin doesn't rule the world. I'd be ecstatic to be wrong. Like I, nothing would make me happier than to be wrong because I know that Bitcoin would help bring the world back to some semblance of rationality. But I also know that Bitcoin has never operated in an environment without profligate central banks doing their thing. What happens when the traditional finance system decides to clean up its act? Now, does Bitcoin rule under those circumstances? I don't know. Does it take longer for Bitcoin to come into its full bloom? Maybe. Does Bitcoin act like gold as a very powerful check and balance to bring the system, the old system, back into some semblance of decency? Ooh, not that. Even if that's all that happens, that's an amazing, amazing thing to have pulled off. Oh. And you should take that win. Yeah, no, safety in the actually, in the Bitcoin standard. In the last chapter of the Bitcoin standard, I think that's a point safe makes is what you just said. If cool. the only thing Bitcoin does is force 
more rational monetary policy at the Fed level, and it's done its job. Uh, yeah, it, it has done its job. What happens if Bitcoin winds up on the Fed's balance sheet? You think that's a possibility? And, you, and I absolutely another do. thing we have to I factor have, in here: Do you think Bitcoin is actually affecting this in any way? The policy decision. I, I think it. I think it is in some ways. I, I Powell's made it very clear that he's at war with stable coins mm-hmm. because stable coins are just euro dollars. Yeah, just the offshore just happens to be in cyberspace as opposed to in you know Brussels or Hong Kong. Yeah, Bitcoin is a bearer asset, like gold. It's the thing on which a it's on which a a um, the foundation of rational monetary policy and a rational banking system is built. So, you know, I can make a very credible. I can do a, I can do a whole schizo post, and I've talked about this in other interviews. I can do a little schizo posting right now, saying, "Look, you know, I've and I've, I've chatted with a, um, one of my patrons who happens to be a." A quant, and a, he's a young guy. I think he's probably about your age, actually. Uh, I've met him. He's, he's a very cool, good kid. You know, I say that on, like, you know, I'm 55. Like, good kid. Right? <laughs> it's, it's so funny. But I, it gives me hope for the future when I listen to some of these. That, that I, I see this kind of energy from the generation coming behind me. It's really important, you know. And um, you know, I, I and I would hope that it's the same kind of thing that guys like Lou Rockwell and ron paul seeing people like me that they would see the kind of energy that i have to try and take it forward the next generation the same thing you know like guys like myself and tom woods and others peter canones and others are doing and then the generation behind us is now taking it and running running the ball and running with the ball and and some of the things that you know we've, we've discussed internally within my 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 patron my patronage is the idea that it's very possible that bitcoin's in there actually helping to liquefy and, and collateralize part of the sofa market. Because, you know, what if Tether isn't, what if Tether has been taken over by the Fed? Wouldn't it be shocking? Like, what if, Tether really? or Circle, like, I wouldn't be shot. I wouldn't be, no, it wouldn't be shocking. Wouldn't be sh- I think Circle would be higher on their, like, easier really? for them to take over. I think, I think they're going to take out Coinbase. I do too. I think okay. I, so, I, I think Tether is actually, because I go back to the Letitia James slap on the wrist. She gave him the J.P. Morgan treatment, like, you know, the J.P. Morgan rigging gold treatment. I uh, pay a fine and give us a, give us a, and, and, and file a bad uh, quarterly report with not nearly enough information in it every quarter. Um, and yeah, you're, you're off the hook. Um, what if Tether actually does have treasuries backing up? I mean, like on one for one, all the Tether that's out there. I mean that's what they're marketing, at least a right. portion of the treasury. Yeah. Well, now now let's now now let's art now let's now let's wonder if, you know, like why has Tether not been taken out yet? Is it just because it's the next one in the, in the, the next one in the chain that needs to be taken out? Powell's been on a on a Powell's like been knocking down all the stable coins one by one by one from the least vulnerable to the, you know, to the most vulnerable to the least vulnerable. Right. What if you need one left? In order to liquefy Bitcoin, you don't want it trading directly against the dollar because it, that creates a whole class of problems and reporting issues and everything else. What if you just want to keep that market liquid? In order to keep li- Bitcoin liquid enough, it's going to need to trade against something. Well, can it trade against the synthetic proxy for the dollar that the Fed controls? Yeah. So you only need one stable coin to do that. And you only need enough of them to liquefy the trading on enough exchanges to keep Bitcoin, to keep price discovery in Bitcoin rational. You get rid of all the leverage and look, Bitcoin's trading. I I don't know about you, but Bitcoin's been trading really, really rationally the last five or six months, certainly since FTX blew up. Yeah. I mean, all the marginal sellers got blown out. All the all the all the bullshit's been whipped out of the market. If you want to see what the dollar trade looks like after the euro dollar, the, the shadow banking system's been collapsed back to a rational size, you're getting a preview of it right now with the way Bitcoin's trading. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that gets to another question too, which is, let's say, 
Jerome Powell is issuing policy going after this plan. We're going to get more sensible monetary policy. Even if that is the case, is it possible for them to fix what they've created? When you consider like debt to GDP. That's a good question. Okay, there's mm-hmm. many there's many ways to recapitalize the United States. Yeah. The first thing is start to start the virtuous cycle of bringing the dollars and the treasuries home, and then allowing the vested and then allowing our commercial banking system to then reinvest in America, as opposed to sending all that money overseas and doing SPACs and all this other you know crazy shit, building factories in China to build build nothing and you know and uh, build skyscrapers to nowhere and, you know, all the rest of it, right? Like, what if we're just going to get back to, you know, I don't know, fixing the bridges, fixing the roads, you know? Fixing the railroads. Fixing the railroads, fixing, like, all the stuff that needs to be fixed. I, I, I can tell you right now that J.P. Morgan doesn't care who they lend to. This is as long as they lend to somebody at a profit. They just yeah. want their 3%, man. Like, so go get it. And you can do it, you can send it overseas, or you can... You can, you know, they're not going to want to build new libraries. And as I, I say this all the time, right? they don't want to build libraries in Palatka, Florida, right? They don't want to build, you know, they don't want to build a tire shop in Dubuque. Like, that's not what they want. That's for the small banks. That's for the regional banks. That's what they're supposed to do. There's still way too many banks in the United States. Okay, there's 350 million people in this country who have, what, 14,000 banks? You know? So... We could have the banking sector in the United States, and we'd still have enough banks to do every, do all the lending we need to do, the rational lending we need to do. Like, that's okay. So again, this, this, there's like, part of like, like the hysteria during Silicon Valley Bank was, you know, from all sides of it was just off the charts. It just <laughs> feels to me like these were talking points seeded into the marketplace by malign actors, which we libertarians ate up because we're all just like, and the Fed, and the Fed, and the Fed, without thinking it through in a real sense about you know what how real business gets done. Like, what if it's not that sinister? What if it's, what if it's bad? Don't get me wrong. Like, I'm not, you know, I don't, it's not like I'm even trying to whitewash the fact that they may have, so our, Big bankers might have all sorts of friggin' terrible plans for us in the future. But you get rid of zero cost dollars, man, and so many of those plans just become untenable mm-hmm. like immediately. And, you know, if the bricks or the bricks, going back to that talking point, uh, that phase of the conversation, if they go to a trade settlement system where they use effectively credits for gold as the means by which to satisfy their trade imbalances every quarter, I would say a quarterly or monthly basis, then they can do bilateral trade. They can trade rupees for rials or yen for, you know, yuan for rubles or whatever. And then at the end of the quarter go, okay, well, you owe me a five tons of gold and I've got a, you know, and I've got plus two tons because I owe three tons of this guy over here, yada, yada, yada. And they just hold it on a freaking blockchain with a, you know, a distributed ledger. And then, you know, once a year, they, they may send a couple of tons of gold, you know, around to each other and then, then settle it all up or just credit them. And, you know, you know what I mean? Like it's very doable. The, the, when gold coins had to move to settle the trade, a century ago, that became a problem. Yep. But today, if it's all, I mean, if they go to that system, Marty, <clears throat> we're going to have to go there. We're going to have to remonetize gold and or Bitcoin in order to back the dollar. There's no other option if they want the dollar to survive. Period. Because superior money will outcompete inferior money. Yeah, and this plays into the narrative too, because the European banks have capital requirement, reserve requirements where they can allocate the gold too. So that would naturally create demand. And, but but at the same time, right, the European, the Europeans, or the dot, these Davosians desperately want to go to fully unbacked money Mm -hmm. that they control. And then they control the value of it by controlling your access to it. And then everybody becomes Iran. That's what they want. Just think of it this way. 
You're just, you know, you're Venezuela and I'm Iran to them. Yeah. The listeners are Russia. <laughs> now, that's what, a C, that's what CBDC is ultimately reduced to. Yeah. So we can get around that. It's not hard. We just, you know, and there's a whole, and there's a whole group of people that represent over 50% of the population on this planet. Admittedly, these are the 50% of the population that Davos wants to get rid of. Useless Why? eaters. Cool. To them, the useless eaters. AI is going to, you know, there's all this AI is going to do away with all these jobs, blah, 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 blah. The robots are going to run everything. It's all this, you know, it's all, I mean, I'll be honest with you, dude. It's, it all sounds like these people just, you know, you know, did too much ayahuasca at a Venus project <laughs> right. um, symposium 15 years ago. And they're just like, you know, let's make that happen. That sounds great. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Yeah, you're doing ayahuasca or MDMA out in Burning Man. Yeah. It all seems like half-baked ideas. Yeah, we were yeah, just talking about real. AI in the conversation I had before this, and there is a lot of hype. It does seem pretty cool, but I don't know if it's going to be what uh, Silicon Valley's making it out to be. Like, I think. No, of course not. Silicon Valley's. Oh, look again, dumb ideas. You know, don't, don't dumb ideas pro proliferate like you know beer wart at the zero bound. <laughs> yeah you know i mean like it's not hard well that's what uh we, we need to be a five percent for a, quite a while and i think the the, the long-term goal i think you know eventually the euro the, the 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 dollar futures curves are all signaling that the federal would be back to three percent by 2025 eh, maybe four but not three i just think these markets are like i i just don't believe in the in the and this is where i i'm getting angry with zero hedge like they are literally arguing the Fed funds futures curve is like gospel handed down from on high. And I'm like, yeah, no. I mean, going back to that, the beginning it, of the conversation, the dot plots in 2021 exactly. would have led you to believe that rates were staying well, very low. It, it, it just, it just gets, it just gets worse and worse and worse when you start thinking about, I mean, look, if nothing proves to you how mispriced those markets can be, I give you the last six weeks or eight weeks since the since the Fed, the FOMC meeting on February first. Like I, the, those markets are broken. Yeah, I mean they're as broken as oil was uh, two weeks ago. Like it's, it's crazy. Yeah, and that Fed funds curve set by the market could just be <laughs> the market really wanting it to happen. But as we said, if the Fed's getting its autonomy back, they have but, to. You know, yeah. But I, I'm sure that this kind of thing was was real back in the 70s and the early 80s when Volcker was doing this. Now, we didn't have the same types of markets. We didn't have Fed funds. I don't think we had Fed funds futures back then. Um, you know, we not, certainly didn't have euro dollar futures. And, you know, so, I mean, and this all comes, you know, this, this you know, if you ask me where this stuff comes from, why I was able to, like, put this stuff together. I've been watching them manipulate the price of the gold for 20 years through the futures curve, through the futures market, right? Like you manipulate the futures market, you can create reality. Okay. So once you see it bodily happen to you in one market, it's not hard to see the same behavior in other markets. So, you know, the, the, the Bank of Japan is still engaging in yield curve control and still subsidizing a lot of, I think, this this um, this futures curve inversion. But, mm -hmm. you know, again, as Mar the, I think the point I didn't make, I didn't finish making about Martin Armstrong and FEMA the, earlier, which is that what Marty pointed out in that, in that blog post was that when the, yeah, I did, make, I did make the point, which is that when the system came under stress, the foreign central banks went to FEMA to get dollars or to get treasury, sorry, because they were desperate for them. And that's why, and, and maybe that's why the, the yield, the U.S. yield curve is so inverted. It's not because, it, oh, there's a recession coming, blah, 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 blah. No, it's because there's a need out there that the Fed set up on purpose. You know, I post, you know, when I said, when I asked that question to, to Daniel Booth, I said, you know, that everybody's out there screaming policy mistake. And I'm like, to me, this is what he needs to do. And she's like, yeah, 
It was a policy mistake, but it was a policy mistake made with eyes open. Yeah. They did it on purpose. Yeah. And you can you can default to they did it because it's because they're evil, or you can do it because it's, it's the only way to break these people. You know. Yeah. So. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. That's what I, this is. This is. I mean, I'm not. You know, again, I. I, I could be wrong about. Even if I'm wrong about 25, even if I'm wrong about 50 percent of this, it's still completely different than what you're getting on CNBC, what you're getting on Bloomberg. When I, I can't, Bloomberg is unreadable anymore. No, I can't even it, get into the articles anymore. I feel like they pay well. Well, I mean, just even the headlines. And half the time, when you when you run the the articles through archive.is and you see the headline and you read the article, the headline they know that nobody can read the articles over Bloomberg. They also know that the algorithms are just scanning the freaking headlines anyway. Yeah. So they're creating reality through headlines on articles that nobody's even reading. Fed speak has moved to the to Fed speak has moved to the uh, to the media. Mm-hmm. And, and the so articles don't even the the text of the articles don't match what's the headline at all. I do this happens all the time. I mean, I may read 10, 12 articles a month from Bloomberg, and 80% of the time, the meat of the article is completely 180 degrees out of phase with the headline. That's very interesting. Say so the media elite, European banking elite, yelling against Powell. So in this context, Powell's... And Diamond. And Diamond. And Goldman and a few others. Don't yeah. leave Diamond... Diamond is very, 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 very instrumental in this. I mean, he really is. And you listen to him talk and you can see it. And you I can see, see it. I can see Diamond very clearly telling you what the policy is and what's going on. What did he come I mean, out last week and said there's going to be like a $2 trillion shortfall in the system? Yeah, I mean, it, he, he knows there's a problem. But I think he's, you know, he knows it, but he knows he has to, we have to deal with it. And, you know, there's only one way to deal with it. You've got to liquidate a whole bunch of stuff. It's going to be hard. It's going to be terrible. But, you know, nothing worth having isn't worth, you know, suffering a little bit for. We've had it a little, we've had it pretty easy. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's been, it's been good times for, I mean, relatively speaking, it's been good times, but... Those good times are, you know, it's a party. They come with a cost, mm -hmm. a massive hangover. Mm -hmm. No, you mentioned it earlier. Like, what if Powell was Fed chair with the same perspective that he has now in 2008? <laughs> what would the world look like? The world would look a lot better than it does right now. We would never have known the name Klaus Schwab. We would have never gone through COVID. We would have never done any of this. The Fed's balance sheet would have went up to about $2 trillion, and then it would have collapsed back, back to around $800 billion. And, you know, Bitcoin would be $50. Yeah. Yeah, here we are. And what do you think yeah, happens? Do you think they, you think they nudge him out? Replace they, him with something? I mean, without, the only way they can get rid of Powell before 2026, when his term is up, is to revoke the Fed's charter. You think they'd go that far? Which is what Elizabeth Warren is, 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 is prepping the narrative for. The, the the Fed will be the central campaign talking point for the twenty twenty four election cycle. You think so? They are going to scream bloody murder and say the Fed made you poor. The Fed cost you your job. The Fed did this. The Fed raised interest rates. The Fed created a recession. It's the Fed's fault. It's the Fed's fault. It's the Fed's fault. I'm telling you, and. I hate to say it, but my libertarian, our libertarian brother, the brethren are going to eat it up and they're going to be the useful idiots of fucking Davos to, and they're going to, and, and I can, I can see it coming a mile away and I can see it coming. It's coming on my Twitter feed, hot and heavy at me every day. I got people calling me grifters, calling me a grifter now. Why? Well, I think, cause they think you're a fed apologist. Is that? Yes. That's the grift. Yeah. I don't think you're a grifter. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think you're explaining the mechanics in a way that I understand them. It makes intuitive sense to me. 
Um, and I've been following I mean, Fed policy. I did it professionally for a couple of years out of college, so like over a decade now. Um, and I mean, like we, Fed policy we, under Yellen and Bernanke was terrible. Yeah. It was awful. And we had every right to be screaming at the Fed. Every right. And we still have every right to scream at the Fed. But, you know, give them, give credit where credit is due at that moment in time. It's like, look, when Trump was president, I lambasted him for the things he did wrong, and I praised him for the things he did right. Same thing with Powell. It's the same thing with any of these people, you know? At the end of the day, the forces of decentralization are winning. We wouldn't be having this conversation if they weren't winning. But the those that want to control everything are going to fight tooth and claw to hold on to what they have. So, you know, expect the pushback, expect the fights, expect them to try and, you know, to attack the very people who may be working in your, you know, who may be your temporary ally. Yeah. I mean, you're seeing then, it. I was going to say, I'm yeah. seeing it with like Elizabeth Warren right now with her like mm -hmm. anti-crypto army. I mean, that's a big theme yeah. in Bitcoin right now is choke point 2.0. Or are they sure. trying to cut us all off? Right. right. But at the same time, don't think that the Fed isn't trying to also choke off aspects of the crypto markets. But again, aspects of crypto, not Bitcoin. Yeah. They want, she wants to go after Bitcoin. The European Union wants Bitcoin gone. Powell never says a bad word about Bitcoin. Like, go, go look for it. I, he's talked about it in Humphrey Hawkins' testimony. He says, I don't care about Bitcoin. Doesn't matter to me. The stable coins are what matters to me. Yeah, and yeah, they've been very consistent throughout the years. We're actually doing a research paper on this. All the Fed's comments on Bitcoin. They're like, yeah, it's a commodity. Mm -hmm. Everything else. Yeah. Maybe it's. Security. And they don't care about it one way or the other. Yeah. 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 They're like, okay. Great. It's a commodity. It's, you know, and that's fine. And it doesn't have to be anything. And that's, but the, but the synthetic dollar market is the issue because if once you can, cause look, most of those stable coins were CBDCs. Okay. They were, they were CBDCs. They were trackable on a blockchain. They're programmable. You could change the value. You could change the rules governing them every day. They were all, they were prototype CBDCs. And if we got to escape velocity in terms of trust in that system, in those, then you're talking about magic beans yeah. as our monetary system. Yeah. Which yeah, is exactly what they want us to do. Circles KYC'd. You have circle particularly in coinbase is stable coin like you can only yeah. use them in certain certain exchanges and yeah mm -hmm. it's uh it's coming that's but the even, uh, just, even even the stuff that existed even the other even the stuff outside of that right even the even the the crypto projects that you you know the the, the even the, the crypto projects that you know um you know the developers went into it with the best of intentions you know, they wanted to create their, you know, a thing, a new, you know, deep, you know, like distributed finance, distributed Forex, you know, whatever. I mean, I, I can go through, like, I, I, I was in, involved in, you know, a number of these. And, and I don't for any reason believe that, the, you know, they weren't, that these guys weren't, you know, on the up and up. But they got subsumed into this whole big, ugly mess as well, because they couldn't stabilize their valuations and, and, and the rest of it without money coming in from, the outside levering everything up and then all the cross platform, you know, bridges and, and all the stuff that happened, which destroyed a lot of good projects that, you know, had some good ideas of how to, you know, create foundational assets, how to create, you know, and, but again, at the end of the day, did you not think if you thought that they were going to, you were going to create your own private central bank, that the central banks wouldn't want to take you out. Yeah. I mean, my <laughs> MakerDAO is a perfect example of this. They're completely, yes. completely uh, capitalized with USDC now. 
a circle stable mm-hmm. coin. Yep. So, I mean, and you know, there may come a day when, and this is why, but this is this is where the Bitcoin maxis are absolutely right. Like, I'm, again, I, I, my, I just just stripped the whole religious iconography outside of you know off of the 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 top of it, the fervor, and I'm all I'm all I'm all on board, right? I, yeah. Like ninety percent of the crypto market is crap. Ninety five, but ninety nine percent of it is garbage. I don't. I, I. I'm still just a proof of work maxi. I believe that proof of work is the thing that matters. It's because that's the thing that's that is the thing that makes those coins commodities, where everything else is just not. It's a tie and, between the physical and digital worlds. It's right. Proof of work, and it's tokenized electricity, whatever you want to call it, right? And which is what really, at the end of the day, what all, you know, all. All of these things are. I mean, gold is just congealed electricity, diesel fuel, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's like you know, gold is like congealed diesel fuel. Yeah. It's, you know, and and human labor. It's ninety percent. That's the ninety percent of the cogs of any friggin' gold company. Go go look at the, go go read a a, a gold company's balance sheet. You know, it's not hard. Like that's what it is. Like aluminum is congealed electricity. That's what it is. It costs an un fucking believable amount of, of electricity to make aluminum metal. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So no, I agree with this. So, and, and you want opportunity cost, you know, in your production of new monetary units. And so remonetizing, so recapitalizing the U S through the tying of the dollar in some way to an opportunity cost create, you know, a, a commodity that was created through the opportunity cost of producing it versus doing anything else with your time, right? That's ultimately what we're talking about here. That's the that's the important link. That's why I've always been, that's from the moment I read the white paper in Bitcoin back in June, late June, 2010. First time I read it. And I went, oh, look, wow, cool. They figured out a way to digitize opportunity cost. Yeah. Great. It, it satisfies me since the regression theorem. I'm good. <laughs> I literally was, I, I, you know, I, I keep going back to this, like back in the original Bitcoin forums. I'm like talking about this stuff going, I just said it satisfies me since the regression theorem. Yeah. Keep it back simple, then, stupid. I, it's all about the energy. That? Keep yeah, it simple, it's, stupid. Yeah. It's, it's, it's about, it's about the opportunity cost. I used to argue with, I used to argue with friggin' monetarists about this shit. Now, I mean, this is why I'm no fan of Milton Friedman, because it was clear that they would just say, "Oh, but you you take the gold, you dig it up, and you stick it in a vault, and then it's just, that's just wasted capital that you could then deploy. We should take that money and send it out into the world." Now, if you do that, then all you wind up with is nothing, backing the currency, which is where we are today. And um, then we just have you know, and then we have to back it up with the full faith and credit of a corrupt <laughs> government and a corrupt central bank. Managing the value of the thing. Oh, but the market will keep everybody honest. Yeah, what if they're all in on it together? Ah, cartels don't. Yeah, they don't. Okay, but they can do an awful lot of damage before they fall. Before the cartels fall apart. Or did you not watch the last fifteen years of the world? Yeah. <laughs> since since Lehman Brothers, like, do you want a better you want a better example than fifteen years of coordinated central bank policy to blow up the freaking world? What the, you know. God. Okay, fine. Yeah, I, I believe in the market, but you know, we can all get crushed in the in the meantime. Yeah, and you know, I, I just I, I I need to give people actionable information before I'm dead. And you know, I mean, don't get me wrong. I stack gold coins. I stack sats, and but at the same time, you know, we have to be able to operate and function in the real world because we only get one life. And so I don't care that Peter Schiff's going to be right thirty years from now. Agreed have to come to grips with reality. That is one thing, like, it's not interesting. I was home and talking to a lot of people, some of which are very successful, have successful businesses, therefore have a lot of money. And they were mentioning to me off the cuff. They know me. It's like family and friends uh, at home. They know me as the Bitcoin guy. And the one thing they were mentioning, like, they were, like, texting me and in person coming out to me, like, how do I get into Bitcoin? Because they were scrambling in the midst of SVB. It's not really the inflation hedge, but the access to their money when they need it. 
um, yeah. that was really giving them the bear asset part of it. It was really beginning to uh, have the light bulb go off in their head because they were like, I moved millions of dollars between like 10 different bank accounts in the last two months because I'm scared shitless. I'm going to wake up. And my money's not going to be there. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I've been, you know, I've been telling people, you know, for years since I started, first started working for Newsmax a decade ago. Crisis had been a decade already. Um, you know, it with, you know, with their gold specifically, because that's what I was, so I, what I was focused on, um, was spread your geographic risk. Keep some at home, keep some as miners at a brokerage account, keep some in another place. You know, if you have, depending on how much you have, I mean, if you got, you know, five grand, it doesn't matter. But, you know, if you got a lot of money, you're, you're not, don't keep all your eggs in one basket. And I tell people today, I'm like, don't be religious about this. Cash, gold, and Bitcoin. Have some of each. Have a little silver. Don't be, don't be doctrinaire about one thing about trying to win. Don't be, don't be so bound up with being right about a thing that you may miss some other thing. There's going to be a bull market. Gold is going to be in a bull market when Bit when Bitcoin's in a bear market and versus Visa and you know, it, it, things are going to happen. You know, and you know, there's a lot of truth I think in some ways that Bitcoin that the gold bugs have a chip on their shoulder because Bitcoin stole a lot of their thunder during the last cycle. But guess what? Now that we know what's happened, Bitcoin was pumped up on purpose to create this whole crypto mania to start the transition to CBDCs. If not, to create an entire monet secondary monetary system outside of the control of the Fed. As a counter. And I think you're going to lose me here for a second. Um, you're back. You're back. Okay. Um, so think of it this way. When Sofer started in 2017, Powell was put on the Fed pretty much the moment when you think, okay, now it's time for us to, we need to come up with another system to shift people over to. And we don't want gold winning. We're going to create this. We're going to, we're going to subvert Bitcoin and all of crypto by creating magic beans as a function of of of, uh, of that and we're just going to lever up the bitcoin to the moon it's very interesting because that bear market after the 17 bull run is what ftx was really birthed out of <laughs> and ether and this and all of that stuff yeah and you can and a lot of people have done a lot of forensic work to go trace it all back there's a who did what when and where and how and you know there's a good there's a good body of evidence now that that's exactly what they did, and they did it on purpose. Yeah. And they used futures to wag the dog. Cash settled futures to wag the dog. Yeah. And also... And, vol and volatility. Would also explain why they haven't approved an ETF yet. Exactly. Um, Even why. though, you know, it's not hard. It's, I, uh, I, a physically settled ETF in Bitcoin would be easier to do than a physically settled one in gold. They made these same arguments for year about not wanting, years for not wanting to do one in gold. We yeah. screamed for a gold ETF for 10 years before we got one. And then when we got one, we got GLD, which they then used to, to, to wash, you know, GLD, the futures, the London Metals Exchange and all that in order to let, lever up the paper gold market to suppress the price of gold. Like, yeah, like, be careful what you wish for. Yeah. You know? I personally don't want an ETF. I want um, people, if you're listening, yeah. you haven't already, take advantage of the bear instrument properties of Bitcoin, hold your own keys, drain the exchanges. Yep. yep. No There's different than the gold market. Keep, you know, just keep same thing. Gold is a little different than Bitcoin because um, Bitcoin every, with every having, right. The stock to flow rate, the stock, flow, the stock to flow ratio rises because the, because the amount of flow into the, of new, into the new Bitcoins into the system makes it harder to liquefy a futures market. Because the miners who are generally net short Bitcoin because they have to sell in order to, to cover their operating costs. No different than gold miners, by the way. No different than gold miners, right? You know, Barrick and Newmont and all the rest of them for years were always, you know, having to sell into the market in order to cover their costs. 
and they would hedge out into the future and they would do and that is the means by part of the means by which gold was kept under control for years so i'm like well it's just the same story is going to play out in bitcoin and it has and then they let it rise when they want it to rise again another lesson going all the way back to jim sinclair in 2005 saying doesn't matter i hate to break this to you folks he said this many many times i'm back on js mindset you can go back through the archives he said, hate to break it to you folks don't get angry about it. The very evil people who are suppressing the price of gold today are going to be the ones who make the most money in the gold bull market that is to come. Your job is to profit on the move when they flip from bull from bear to bull. Yeah. That's all you can do. You can't fight them. All you can do is work with the trade. Grab the middle 60%, leave 20% at the top and 20% at the bottom for the God agreed. And you'll make life-changing money for you. And if everybody took his advice, the gold market would be healthier than it is today. Same thing with Bitcoin. So with every bull run and every bear run, be smart. You know, shop smart, shop that smart. Don't be dumb. Buy low, sell high, and learn how to read a chart. And, you know, keep your emotions in check. Yeah. When you've made good money in any trade, Always take your original stake off the table. Put the other stuff away. Uh, I, I did a great podcast with Chris Sullivan, uh, who runs uh, uh, Hyperion Decimus, which is a Bitcoin hedge fund. Mm -hmm. And all we talked about for an hour was money is a not a not an end unto itself. It's a means to an end. It's a means to real wealth. And that's what drives. The, I know that's what drives the Bitcoin guys. I know it's what drives the gold guys. And I view, and I've said this in previous places, and I'll say it again here. Then I'm going to have to run because I, I, it's, been, it's been an hour and a half. I'll leave you guys with this. If you haven't watched the show Yellowstone, watch the first episode. Hell, all you have to do is watch the first 10 minutes of the first episode because Kevin Costner's character, Dutton, tells you everything you need to know about the ethos of the show and of what wealth is in that first 10 minutes. I mean, discussing with his son, Jamie, I don't know if you've watched Yellowstone or not, but it's that oh, first seen it. episode when they're talking about, you know, hey, uh, and, you know, they're, they're talking about the potential to sell a part of the ranch to the invest to the to the property. Private developers equity coming. Jamie's talking about how, hey, I, I said no, but it also gives us leverage. And Dutton turns to him and goes, leverage is knowing that if you had all the money in the world, this is what you would buy. Yeah. The ranch. Yeah. That's it. That's the mindset of those people. They have that. They bought the castles and they have the, the lands and they have the this and they have all those, the real wealth. All the rest of it is a shadow play. And everything else they do is to try and separate you from the process of building real wealth for yourself. What they're scared of is the serfs get wealthy. And they want us to be serfs again. And CBDCs of all in all forms and all shapes and forms are that. And... I don't see the I don't see the young money, relatively speaking, the American oligarchs, banking oligarchs, are the nouveau riche of the West. Mm -hmm. They aren't the old money. Some of them are, right? Some of them are from old money, sure, but it's it's a different thing. There's we we are still looked we are still looked down on as the uncouth Yanks. They still think we're their colonies and that yeah. they just want their colonies back. And when you, when you put it through, when you think of it in those terms, yeah, um, we can say no to that. Yeah, flip to your and perspective. We, and we have the right people in place. We can, we can say no to it and we can move on and yeah. we can bankrupt. No, I think that's what's going on. I agree. I'm happy you said that because my big plan during the next bull market is to buy a ranch. Um, that's, what, That's uh, a very laudable goal, Marty. I bought my little slice of heaven with almost no money back in 2003. I've been here for 20 years now. Yeah. So That's... my goal now is to finish it. Well, if it happens in the next two years, I'll be on the same trajectory as you. I'll be 33. You're 55 now. You've been there for 20 years. Yeah. Goals. Goals to set for. There you go. Uh, All right. All good, man. It's so good to, uh, I, but I really should run. Yeah, you go enjoy time with your family. 
All right. Um, thank you for doing this. And uh, sure. it's always a pleasure, sir. I love your perspective. You. Appreciate it. I really do. And I, I enjoy coming on. So we'll do this again in a few months. Yeah. Let's do it again in a few months. All right. Sounds good. All right, man. All right. You can take, and uh, everybody watching, you take care. You guys have fun. Keep your stick on the ice. You guys know what to do. All right. Do the thing. Peace and love, freaks. Take care.